Well, hello and welcome everybody to this special colloquium on an exciting and very important new book, Noise, A Flaw in Human Judgment, and happy Thanksgiving to the Americans who are watching us. My name is John Tasulis, and I am the director of Oxford's Institute for Ethics in AI. And before introducing our speakers today, uh, I want to say a few words about this important book. So the book aims to identify and seeks to ameliorate a pervasive flaw in human judgment, and that is the flaw of noise. Now, noise, according to the authors, has tended to fly under the radar somewhat, being outshone by its more charismatic sibling, bias. Bias is a predictable error inclining people's judgment in a certain direction. For example, excessive severity in sentencing people of color or favoritism towards white males in scrutinizing job applications. Noise by contrast consists in what the authors called unwanted variability in judgments. So no, noisy judgments are not necessarily biased in one direction, they are all over the place as it were. We can find noise in the judgments of a single decision maker. For example, a judge whose decisions vary depending upon the time of day or whether their football team has won or lost over the weekend. But we can also find noise at a more systemic level in the judgments of a group of decision makers. And here, amongst the many examples offered by the authors, there is the example of asylum law in the United States, where one judge may be 18 times more likely to grant asylum than another judge in the very same courthouse, a situation that has been described as refugee roulette. So that's a kind of paradigm case of noisy variability in judgments. Therefore, as the authors say, quote, reducing noise is always an improvement. So why is noise bad? Well, there seem to be two main reasons offered by the authors. The first is that noisy decisions inevitably involve erroneous decisions. Therefore, reducing noise should be conducive to greater accuracy in decision-making. Though, of course, the authors admit that it's possible to eliminate noise by having entirely erroneous decisions, provided they are erroneous in the same direction. Understood in this way, the elimination of noise looks like a technocratic project or more broadly, a project in instrumental rationality. Whatever the goals of a decision-making structure may be, whether good goals or bad goals, noisy judgments hinder those goals from being realized. But it, it would be wrong though, to construe this book as exclusively technocratic or value neutral in this way. There is on the contrary also a powerful moral charge that runs through this book. And this is crystallized by the second way in which noise is judged to be bad by the authors. And that is that it's a source of potentially severe unfairness and injustice. So go back to the asylum seeker case, it seems excruciatingly unfair if both I and my brother are asylum seekers in exactly the same situation, but his application is dealt with by the judge who tends to approve 18 times more applications than the judge handling my case. Indeed, although the authors hang back from saying that noise reduction should be part of the universal declaration of human rights, a new kind of right to silence, as it were, they do say that noise can be a rights violation, that this variability in judgments can be a rights violation. So you might ask, what is the link to artificial intelligence? Well, the answer according to the authors is that algorithmic decision-making is guaranteed to eliminate noise. Does that mean that we should replace clinical decision-making by humans with algorithmic decision-making by AI-based tools wherever we can feasibly do so? I think it's fair to say that the authors have no compelling principled objection to such a move but they do observe in an important chapter entitled Dignity that humans have a strong attachment, perhaps in their eyes, it might be better described as an addiction, both to exercising personal judgment themselves and to having their situation, their cases, their applications adjudicated by someone exercising situation specific judgment in the face-to-face -face context. So I think 
this is taken as a stubborn fact of human psychology, this addiction we have to exercising judgment and being judged on a case by case basis. And that this phenomenon for the authors, I think, sets a kind of pragmatic limit to the extent to which AI can displace human judgment. In this spirit, therefore, the authors offer some constructive proposals towards the end of the book regarding how algorithms and other techniques of decision hygiene can help us reduce the level of noise produced by our decisions. So that's the introduction to the book. Let me now welcome the three authors of the book, Daniel Kahneman, who is the Eugene Higgins Professor of Psychology at Princeton University. He was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2002, and is the author of the international bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. Olivier Siboney is Professor of Strategy and Business Policy at HEC Paris, and is the author of You're About to Make a Terrible Decision, a book that by the sounds of it I should have read many years ago. And thirdly, and hopefully he's online with us, um, he did say he might be on the road, is Cass Sunstein, who is the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard University. He is the most cited legal scholar of recent times, co-author of the book Nudge, and has held posts in both the Obama and currently the Biden administration. Now, the way we're gonna proceed is Olivier is gonna give us um, a sort of half an hour outline of the contents of this book, and then we will proceed to some commentary from our panel of commentators. And then there will also be a chance for people to ask questions. So please use the chat box function on YouTube to raise your questions and we'd be delighted to put them to the speakers. But I'm now gonna turn over to Olivier who will introduce this book to us. Thanks, Olivier. Thank you, John, and hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I might actually not speak for half an hour, John, because you already gave an excellent summary of the book. And, and in fact, you already introduced some of the themes that we were hoping to, to talk about this afternoon or morning or whatever it is, wherever you are. But let me try to expand a little bit on the, on the introduction that you gave and to describe the main themes that we cover in the book and the main contentions that we're making. We define noise as unwanted variability in judgments, in human judgments, that should otherwise be identical. This implies, and this, it's important to, to stress this from the get-go, that we're talking about professional judgments based made in organizations, made on behalf of organizations by people who are in those organizations. We're not talking about personal choices where people might quite legitimately have very different values and preferences. We're not talking about matters of taste. We're not talking about matters of opinion. We're, not, we're also not talking about topics on which variability is desirable because ideas are in competition with one another. For instance, we're not talking about problems of innovation. The kinds of problems that we're talking about are decisions where people would generally agree either that there is a correct answer and we're looking for it, or that there is probably a correct answer, although we're not quite sure what it is, but we behave as if there were one. An example of the first type would be that you are seeing a doctor and a different doctor would give you a different diagnosis. I think we would all agree that one of these doctors, at least, perhaps both, is wrong if they have a different diagnosis of the same patient. This is one of those cases, and you alluded to them, John, where noise is a source of error because clearly one of those diagnoses or both are wrong. This is going to be the case in many situations where there is an actual true value that judgment is aiming for. Whenever we're making a forecast, for instance, that's going to be a problem. There are also a lot of cases where it is going to be impossible to know what the true value is, but in fact, the whole organization behaves as if there is a true value. And the core belief of the people who are making the judgment is that they are trying to approach this value. You gave the example of justice, and we're going to expand on it in a minute. Clearly, people would not find it acceptable if justice was a lottery. And to the extent that the way the justice, systems, the justice system allocates a judge to a case is a lottery, and to the extent that this lottery determines the outcome, that would seem to be a case of noise that creates a form of injustice. Now, when we say human judgment is noisy, this isn't in itself a surprise. 
the fact that different people have different judgments on a dif difficult question is almost tautological. When we say something is a matter of judgment, we are implying that people are going to disagree to some degree. What makes noise an important topic, in our view, is that this disagreement is much larger, is much greater than we generally assume it to be. You gave a few examples of refugee roulette. Let me give you a couple more. In an insurance company where individuals who are more or less interchangeable in principle are setting the prices of insurance policies, they're called the underwriters, the people who put a price on the risk, essentially. We asked the top managers of the company, how much difference do you expect between two of these underwriters? Remember, these are experts who are applying the policies of the company and who are setting a price that commits the company and that they are setting on behalf of the company. The answer of the senior executives was, well, of course, these people aren't machines, so we're not expecting them to be in perfect agreement. We think something in the region of 10% would probably be an acceptable difference. It turns out when the experiment is done and when you actually measure what different underwriters assign to the same contract, that the difference, the median difference, is in the region of 55%, five times larger than expected. And this is a finding that we have time and again every time we do one of those measurements, which we call a noise audit, where we take the same judgment problem and we give it to different people. People assume that they are going to be in agreement. There is an assumption of agreement, an assumption of consensus, and that assumption turns out to be wrong as soon as we measure what different people actually think of the same case. You mentioned refugee roulette. In the justice system, there was a, a study done many years ago, in fact, in the US of uh, sentencing, where in some cases, different judges would sentence the exact same person under the same circumstances to one year in prison or life in prison. The median difference between two judges was in a case where the sentence was seven years on average was almost four years. So basically in half of the cases, the difference between two sentences would be more than four years for an average sentence of seven years. I think we are all surprised by this degree of variability, whether it is tolerable and whether we have a good solution for it is another issue. But the first thing we should say about noise is it is larger than we think. We summarize this by saying, wherever there is judgment, there is noise, and probably more of it than you think. Now, why is that a problem? You've alluded to the two reasons why it's a problem. I would, in fact, add a third one. The first one, as you said, is it's a source of error whenever there is a true value. Bias is, of course, a source of error. Noise is also a source of error. There need not be bias for noise to be a source of error. Suppose, for instance, to, to take a simple example, that there is a disease out there that is underdiagnosed because it's not sufficiently recognized. Doctors are, haven't been trained to recognize the symptoms. Patients are not aware that this is the disease that they have. And so the rate at which the disease is diagnosed is not as high as the actual prevalence of the disease in the population. That would be a bias in the system. Now, suppose that you fix this bias and you actually get the rate of diagnosis to match the prevalence of the disease in the population. There is no bias anymore. But there remains a very serious problem is the individuals in whom the disease is diagnosed are not the ones who are actually sick. So it's a fairly trivial example, but we can see that we can have a lot of errors in the absence of bias. We don't care about the average, we don't just care about the average decision being correct. We care about each decision being correct whenever there is a correct decision to be made, as would be the case, for instance, in medicine. The second case you talked about is the case of decisions where there isn't a normatively correct answer. When we're talking about sentencing or even about refugees, there is no obvious and generally accepted way of saying that the correct sentence for this individual is six years and the correct sentence for that individual in that case is 12 years. It remains a problem, as you pointed out, that if the answer depends on the happenstance of who the judge happens to be, that would seem to be a problem and a clear case of injustice. It is striking that we are not as offended, not as shocked by that injustice as we are 
by the problem of bias. If we hear that two defendants have been sentenced very differently because one is white and the other is black, we are shocked and we should be. If we hear that two defendants have been sentenced very differently because one was lucky to get the lenient judge and the other was unlucky to get the severe judge, we sort of shrug and say, well, that's life. And one of the things that we're trying to say in noise is we shouldn't just shrug. We should work up a little outrage about this and recognize that injustice remains injustice, even when it is due to something that we can't explain as easily as bias. So that is the second reason, as you pointed out, injustice. There is a third reason, which is perhaps less important, but which we should mention, which is that an organization that is seen as making decisions in a haphazard, slightly random way, quickly loses its credibility. Part of the reason we are reluctant to admit how much noise there is in organizations is because we realize that noise makes a mockery of the existence of the organization. If the underwriters in the insurance company realized how much they disagree, they would have to face the fact that perhaps their job is not what they think it is, and perhaps their role is not as needed as they think it is. So our, our bottom line in terms of facing the basic facts is we should do much more to combat noise. And as you pointed out, this raises the important question, especially important in, in this group today, of what is the role of algorithms and artificial intelligence in doing that? As we have said, wherever there is judgment, there is noise. The logical, the, the other logical way to say this is wherever you want there not to be any noise, you must eliminate judgment. So the only way to make sure that there is no noise at all is to replace human judgment with algorithms. And in fact, rules and algorithms are effective, are good at making judgments or at approaching the correct value in judgments that have a correct value, largely because they are noise-free. We know this, we have known this for a long time. Of course, it becomes a lot more true when algorithms become better. And today's algorithms are better than algorithms of 50 years ago. But even algorithms of 50 years ago were generally slightly better than humans at making difficult predictions. We've known this for a long time. Does that mean that we should outsource all the decisions that we can to algorithms? You say that we uh, note the addiction of humans to judgment. That's your word, not ours. We haven't actually used the term, as you pointed out. We uh, recognize that humans care about making judgments. We also recognize that there are many very legitimate reasons for people to want to make judgments. There is dignity, as you pointed out, but there is also the fact that algorithms or any mechanical method of decision making will deprive the people who are in charge of those decisions of a sense of agency will deprive those organizations of the sense of accountability that they want to be able to have, will introduce in some cases biases, or in many other cases will reinforce and perpetuate the biases that have been present in human decisions before, because algorithms that are trained on past decisions will reflect the biases that have affected those past decisions. So we are not actually claiming that all decisions should be made by algorithms, and we, we do not uh, resign ourselves to the fact that uh, that is not the case simply because humans are addicted to it. We fully recognize that there are many reasons why noise reduction techniques would be unacceptable in some situations. What we try to stress is that just because some of the noise reduction techniques, including algorithms, and we're going to talk briefly about some others, just because some of the noise reduction techniques have downsides does not mean that noise is acceptable. Just because we don't have a cure does not mean that we should accept or romanticize the disease. It doesn't make noise desirable to recognize that some of the remedies to noise might be undesirable. What it does is that it makes us, in our view, want to look for better remedies to noise that are more appropriate to the situations that we're talking about. So if algorithms aren't a good remedy, and in many cases they won't be, we should look for other solutions. 
And when we're talking about solutions that can reduce noise in human judgments, not in algorithmic judgments, which eliminate human judgments, but that can reduce noise in human judgments, we talk about what we call decision hygiene, which is a way for humans to essentially borrow a page from the book of algorithms to get inspiration from the way algorithms decide, which is that decision hygiene makes you more reliable, makes you more stable in your judgments, makes you more disciplined in your judgment, basically adds some hygiene to the way you make your judgments. How does this work? Well, there's a number of techniques. One of those techniques is what has been called in the context of forecasting, among other things, active open-mindedness, being prepared to change your mind on the basis of facts, being prepared to let yourself be contradicted by people who bring different opinions, actively looking for information that would prove you wrong. That's the sort of mindset that we would expect humans to bring to their judgments when they are uh, using decision hygiene. Another aspect of decision hygiene is the sequencing of information to make sure that we do not receive information that we don't need in order to make a judgment and that might actually bias us. A good example of this is the analysis of fingerprints. It turns out that, and, and we know this from some fairly recent research, that fingerprint experts, people who say these fingerprints are a match or aren't a match, can actually be influenced by unwanted information. Their judgments can be noisy. If you give them only the information that they need when they need it, if, for instance, you do not give them information about the case that they don't need to look at the fingerprints, then they will be less noisy and you will improve their decisions. This sort of sequencing of information is a form of decision hygiene. And finally, there's a more organized form of decision hygiene that we recommend for many decisions, which we call structuring information which basically breaks down the decision into its components and makes sure that the people who are looking at the decision consider the various dimensions of the decisions. A case in point or a, a typical example of this would be a hiring decision where we have a lot of evidence that people will tend to form an early intuitive holistic judgment about candidates that they're meeting. We would instead encourage them to do what in theory they should do and what in practice they often don't, which is to identify the dimensions that they care about in the job description, identify methods to evaluate the candidates on those dimensions that are going to be as independent of each other as possible, have different people evaluate the candidates on those dimensions, basically make sure that their judgment is as decomposed as organized, as structured as the judgment of an algorithm would be without actually outsourcing this judgment to an algorithm. These are some of the noise reduction techniques that we propose. There are a few more. All of them have something in common, which is that they call for a realization that when we are making a decision on behalf of an organization, and again, I stress that this is not all the decisions that we make in life. These are the decisions, the professional judgments that we make on behalf of the organizations in which we are employed, we should be striving for a form of uniformity, a form of consistency with our peers. We should not be striving for self-expression. We should be trying to make a decision that is the same decision that other people in the organization would make, not to express ourselves and to express our personal values and idiosyncrasies in the decision that we're making. This is a mindset, but it's an important mindset because all the procedures that we are talking about will be reflecting that mindset and will introduce that mindset. Basically, that's the, that's the story. You see, I've been a, a bit shorter than the 30 minutes you gave me. Um, we believe that noise is a problem. Noise, we believe that noise is much larger than, is, is, there is much more noise than people assume there is. It's an under-recognized problem. We think it's always a problem. We define noise as unwanted variability. There are many situations, again, where variability is not a problem, but in those situations where we expect uniformity, noise is a problem of error, a problem of injustice, and a problem of organizational credibility. Noise can be eliminated by algorithms. That doesn't mean we should always use algorithms. That means we should always recognize the existence of noise and ask ourselves if, if it is worth reducing it. If it is not with algorithms, we can reduce noise with 
forms of decision hygiene that call on individuals to stop trying to express themselves as much as they sometimes do, and instead to make decisions on behalf of the organization that are more disciplined and more rigorous. That's basically the story, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was a really excellent and lucid introduction. And I'm delighted to see also that now Cass Sunstein has joined us as well. I'm now going to introduce our three wonderful commentators. So they are Ruth Chang, who is the chair and professor of jurisprudence at the University of Oxford. Her research is focused on the idea of what it is to be a rational agent, especially when it comes to making hard choices. Second, Rachel Fraser, who is an associate professor of philosophy at Oxford and a fellow of Exeter College. She's a real all-rounder. Her research traverses epistemology, language, ethics, and politics, among other domains. And finally, Anand Rao, who is a partner in PricewaterhouseCooper, where he is the global artificial intelligence lead. Both his PhD and early research career were in artificial intelligence he now brings his technical expertise to the task of implementing AI-based solutions to executive decision-making. So thank you very much to our three commentators. I'm gonna ask Rachel to kick us off. Hi, thanks so much. So right at the start of Noise, the authors write the following. They write, it would be outrageous if three similar people convicted of the same crime received radically different penalties. Probation for one, two years in jail for another, 10 years in jail for another. So call this the consistency requirement. The consistency requirement says that justice is violated whenever two similar people commit exactly the same crime but receive very different penalties. Something like the consistency requirement is routinely appealed to within the book Noise but it's never really argued for in any kind of systematic way. So what I want to do in my comments is talk a little bit about whether we should actually endorse the consistency requirement, whether we should sign up to this consistency requirement or whether we should actually say, hang on, no, maybe the consistency requirement does not articulate a genuine requirement of justice. Spoiler, I think the consistency requirement does not articulate a genuine requirement of justice. So, there are a few different ways you might try to argue for the consistency requirement. I thought of four. Uh, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm only going to talk about two. So I'm going to talk about these two different ways you might argue for the consistency requirement. The first is an argument from intuition. The second is an argument from luck. And I'll sketch both of these arguments and suggest why I don't think they're particularly compelling arguments in favor of the consistency requirement. So the first way you might argue for the consistency requirement is you might just appeal to intuition. I mean, this is something philosophers do all the time. If they like a principle, they'll say, look, I just have a really strong intuition that this principle is true. My gut tells me that this principle is true. So you might appeal to an intuition. You might say, look, I just really strongly intuit that the consistency principle articulates a requirement of justice. The problem with this argument is twofold. The first problem with this argument is that not everyone shares this intuition. So when I read the book, I was quite startled because it seemed like all three authors very strongly intuited that at least something in the ballpark of the consistency requirement is true. And I just did not find myself sharing this intuition. I was sort of kind of on the fence. I was like, maybe these kinds of noisy sentences are unjust, but it's not obvious to me that they are. But then I thought, okay, maybe I'm idiosyncratic, like maybe my intuitions are peculiar. So I ran an unscientific poll. I asked people what they made of the consistency requirement. The results were striking. About 50% of people, in fact, just under 50% of people, seemed to have intuitions that sided with the authors of noise. They thought the consistency requirement articulates a genuine requirement of justice. Just over 50% of people, I mean, this, this poll was pretty much as close as Brexit, you know, it was very knife edge. But about 50% of people said, no, I don't think noisy sentencing is a clear violation of justice. I don't have an intuition that speaks in favor of the consistency requirement. So this is very striking. And particularly given the kind of broader argumentative project of noise, right? 
what is the broader argumentative project of noise? Well, one of the major projects of noise is to make us more suspicious of our gut feelings, to point out to us that our feelings of subjective certainty, the kind of emotional rewards we get when we rely on our gut in making judgments, that these might not be very reliable ways of forming judgments. So I think it would be slightly awkward for the authors of noise if the best argument for the consistency requirement was an argument that appealed to gut feelings, particularly when it turns out these are gut feelings that about 50% of people don't seem to share. So I don't think the consistency, the, the consistency requirement is going to be well motivated by an appeal to intuition. So here's a better argument for the consistency requirement. This is, a, can you, this is the argument for the consistency requirement that appeals to luck. So we'll call this the luck argument for the consistency requirement. And I think this is a sort of argument that is gestured towards at various points in the book, though never systematically developed. And Olivia also in his overview of the book kind of gestured towards it as well in his summary. Um, so this, <laughs> this argument starts with a thought experiment, right? So call this thought experiment, the lottery thought experiment. So you can imagine that instead of having judges do sentencing, we adopt the following procedure to decide what penalties are assigned to people found guilty of crimes. We have a big bucket with a bunch of different sentences written on slips of paper. And when someone's found guilty, I stick my hand into this big bucket, rummage around, pull out a slip, and I say, okay, it's 10 years in prison for you. So I think most people are gonna agree that this would be a clearly unjust way of setting things up. I mean, I strongly intuit in this case that you know, this would be an extremely bad way. This would be a huge violation of justice. So I think we can all be on the same page when it comes to the claim that these kinds of lottery mechanisms for sentencing are unjust. And you might think, okay, well, the fact that these lottery situations are so clearly unjust motivates a principle. We'll call it the new luck principle. The new luck principle says, look, justice requires that luck not play any role in determining which sentence an agent receives. And it, it does seem like at least prima facie of this sort of lottery example I just gave you motivates this no luck requirement. And then you might think, hey, well, now we're pretty much home and dry because we can use the no luck requirement to argue for the consistency requirement. Because we can argue like this, we can say, look, justice requires that luck not play a role in determining which sentence an agent receives. But if two people who are really, really similar do exactly the same crime, but receive very different penalties, then it seems like luck has played a role in determining which sentences an agent receives. And so the consistency requirement is gonna fall out of the no luck requirement, plus this, I think, correct observation that in cases of noisy sentencing, luck has played a role in determining which penalties are assigned. The problem with this argument is I think that the no luck requirement is false. I don't think it's true that justice requires that luck never play a role in determining which penalty it, someone who's found guilty of a crime receives. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to offer a counterexample to the no luck requirement. So the no, no luck requirement says, hey, justice requires that luck play no role in determining which sentence uh, or what penalty uh, someone receives when they commit a crime. So let's call this drive, right? So here's the case. Um, suppose you've got like two states with a long border in between them. So like New Hampshire and Vermont have this kind of border. Um, and suppose that there's a road, there is in fact a road that kind of winds its way along the border between Vermont and New Hampshire, right? The road is sometimes in Vermont, sometimes in New Hampshire, it kind of wiggles its way in between these two states. And let's suppose that this road has a speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour. And let's suppose that that's, that speed limit applies both in Vermont and in New Hampshire. So now I suppose that where Vermont punishes speeding really, really harshly, if you're found guilty of speeding in Vermont, you get like a year in prison. Whereas if you're found guilty of speeding in New Hampshire, you get a light fine, right? So now let's consider an agent, call him John, right? So suppose that John speeds along this road, this road that sort of winds its way between Vermont and New Hampshire. Let's also suppose that Vermont and New Hampshire are like you know, poverty stricken states. So they only have one speed camera between them and they have to share this speed camera, right? So Vermont gets the speed camera Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and New Hampshire gets the speed camera all the other days of the week. And John happens to be driving down the road on a Monday. So on a Monday, that's a day where the one speed camera is a Vermont speed camera. 
and the Vermont speed camera catches John speeding. And so John gets a year in prison because he's found guilty in Vermont of speeding and Vermont punishes speeding really, really harshly. So clearly John got really unlucky here. He got unlucky because it was only bad luck that meant he was caught speeding on a day where Vermont got the speed camera rather than a day where New Hampshire got the speed camera. If he'd been speeding on a Tuesday on a day where New Hampshire gets the speed camera, he'd have got a light fine. So we have a case here in which luck plays a really pretty crucial role in determining which penalty an agent receives when they commit a crime. But I don't think there's any injustice here. It seems perfectly legitimate for Vermont and New Hampshire to punish speeding to different degrees. And it doesn't seem like there's been any kind of procedural violation in this case. So what we have here is a case in which luck determines, luck plays a role in determining what penalty an agent receives when they perform a crime but where there's no injustice present. So it seems like we have a counterexample to the no luck requirement. So we're not going to be able to use the no luck requirement in turn to argue for the consistency requirement, but it's the consistency requirement that the authors of noise seem to endorse and rely on systematically through their argument. So of course, I don't want to overstate my case, right? I've sketched two arguments for the consistency requirement and suggested that they're not very good arguments. That's consistent with there being a great argument out there for the consistency requirement that I have not considered. But at least right now, I am at best agnostic about the consistency requirement. So I'd be interested in hearing whether there are any sort of great arguments for the consistency requirement that I'm just not considering right now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. So I'm gonna pass on now to Ruth. Thank you. Um, like Rachel, I'm going to ex I'm going to just not go through all the nice fees, great book, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'd like to start with a fact about Oxford academic life. Every faculty member at Oxford shares in an annual communal exercise, the marking of end of year student essays and exams. There are always two independent markers per script. Sometimes there's agreement on a mark or a range of marks, but interestingly, there is also sufficiently often disagreement between the markers, not only by one or two points, but as to the class of the mark warranted, such as between you know, a mid two one or a first or between a two two or a high two one. For North Americans, that's like disagreeing between a B plus and an A or between a C and a B plus. So the variability can, can be quite wide. In fact, I know of a case where one marker thought the paper should fail and the other marker thought it deserved a first. Now the Oxford rule is that when there's a difference of two or more points, the markers must get together to discuss the essay. And the discussion is pretty instructive. What usually happens is that each marker lays out what they take to be the strengths and weaknesses of the paper and their implicit weighting of those strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes one marker will point to a factor that the other marker didn't take into consideration and they'll discuss whether that factor is relevant. So the fruits of such discussions uh, in the face of this variation and evaluation are threefold. First, a determination of which factors are relevant. Second, a discussion of how well the paper does with respect to those factors. And third and most importantly, a substantive normative exploration of what weight the different merits of the paper with respect to those factors should have. Does, for example, you know, this particular attempt at originality count for much more than that expert, but rather rote recitation of a slew of complex material? Both show mastery and expertise, but of rather different kinds. The markers might refuse to settle. One marker insisting that the essay deserves a 65, while the other thinking, hey, this is a first class paper and should deserve 70. The rule is then that they split the difference because they have to put down something on the Excel spreadsheet. Now, Kahneman, Siboney, and Sunstein, I'm just gonna call them KSS for short, uh, would have us believe that this is noise, what they define as unwanted variability in judgments in the same or similar cases. Critically for them, noise is a normative phenomenon. It's not just variability, because some variability is okay, but bad variability. Noise, they tell us, can be undesirable in three ways. First, you know, you get things wrong. Second, 
you know, it's unfair because like, how come you as a student were so unlucky to get the uh, marker who's extra harsh? Um, and what class of degree you get shouldn't depend on the vagaries of who you happen to get as marker. And third, you know, will the students here in Oxford revolt and insist on algorithms instead of professors to mark their exams once they learn of the variability in marker judgments? Will Oxford lose its credibility as an institution if it holds itself out as marking correctly, but in fact, there is sometimes wide variability in marking judgments? The take home message of the book is quite sweeping. Whenever there is judgment, there is noise and probably a lot more of it than you think. But I, I wonder whether this is really the case. Is variability in judgment typically or mostly a bad thing, even when the organization holds itself out as an organization that makes the correct judgment? I doubt it. It seems to me that noise defined as unwanted variation in judgment is quite a rare phenomenon, especially in the judgments that matter in human life. The most ubiquitous and interesting cases of judgment variation are not, I think, cases of noise, not cases of undesirable or unwanted variation. And that's, that's not something that we need technology to help us correct. So I think it's helpful to distinguish between two kinds of cases, messy and neat. Neat cases are ones in which a judgment is evaluated against a genuine single bullseye. You make a mistake. Right when you diagnose a tumor as benign, when it's malignant, or when you make a prediction that turns out to be incorrect. If a radiologist late in the day gets tired and shows a tendency to miss malignant tumors, that's bad and we need to do something about it. And AI might be the right thing. So I'm all on board as far as that goes. But now think about messy cases. Messy cases are ones in which there's no single correct bullseye but multiple legitimate bullseyes. It doesn't matter how the organization holds itself out. Uh, you know, it can say we're an organization, we're an insurance company that gets you the right um, evaluation of the, you know, the value of your, of, of your property and so on. But if in fact the questions it asks are messy with multiple bullseye, the case is a messy case, not a neat case. Uh, I think that the majority of the cases that KSS discuss are messy, not neat. So take bail bond decisions. There are multiple factors relevant to evaluating whether to grant bail to a defendant. There's the probability that they'll recidivate. There's the risk to them of being harmed while in custody given their features. There's the risk to them of being harmed if not in custody, if they turn on you know, fellow gang members still roaming the streets. There are multiple ways to weigh up these different factors and no one right answer. The same goes for, I think, the bulk of the other cases that KSS discuss or reference, such as child custody cases, asylum decisions, personnel decisions, sentencing decisions, patent decisions. Only it seems to me a handful of the main cases on which KSS focus are clearly neat and those tend to focus on predictive forecasting, for, for instance, judging whether a new product will earn a certain market share. And of course, the important case of medical diagnosis, maybe the fingerprint matching case is a neat case. I'm not sure how the process works. Uh, it, I think it's worth pointing out that the neat cases tend to involve only non-normative, predictive, or uh, cl classificatory judgments while messy cases typically involve normative or evaluative judgments. KSS seemed to assume that where an organization holds itself out as making correct judgments, the judgments they make should be neat. And because they're not neat, we have noise and then, you know, all hell breaks loose. But in fact, I believe the judgments they make are messy. So let's focus on messy cases. In messy cases, there are, by hypothesis, multiple legitimate bullseyes. Marking student essays is a messy case. Is the variation in judgment a good thing? I would argue yes, for two reasons. First, variation in normative judgment is necessary for learning. It's when 
you and I disagree normatively that there's the possibility of teaching each other a thing or two. Through talking with one another or just contemplating your judgment, I can learn how you see things and reflect on how I see things. In this way, we can each become increasingly better, more nuanced and more sensitive judges. A Black Lives Matter activist can teach Boris Johnson something about how to understand just how tiresome and debilitating microaggressions are on a lived life. And maybe Boris Johnson can teach the activist something about the limits of institutional power. Judges within and across jurisdictions vary widely in sentencing for the same crime. Is this a problem? Not if, as the judges themselves tend to think, they're taking into account differences that make a difference. What if the variation is really wide, as it sometimes is? On the face of things, you know, we'd want to hear about the judge's reasoning. We shouldn't, from the armchair, assume that this variability is unwarranted. There's the crime, for sure, with its elements ticked off, but there's also how it was committed and in what context. It's perhaps worth noting that sentencing guidelines have been created out of the range of judgments handed down by judges across jurisdictions, each of which is assumed to have some prima facie legitimacy despite their wide variation. It's also worth noting as KSS do that the vast majority of federal judges reject mandatory sentencing ranges. They think that we can't ex ante jimmy up a list of all the possible future specific mitigating and enhancing factors for each crime and all of their factorial combinations, build in some Aristotelian organic unities, throw in some evolving social and political changes that might affect how we should think about the factors and feed them into an algorithm and get a single correct answer. Judicial discretion is a key part of the job of judging that discretion reflects the fact that there are multiple legitimate ways to go. And that's true even in the face of, you know, part of what it is to be a judge, which is to lay down the law. This is the right answer. So, right, judges hold themselves out as um, working with a single bullseye. But in fact, the kind of judging that they're doing is messy. The second reason that variability in judgment is not to be regretted, I think, is because such variation is accurate. Most of the important judgments in life are messy. There are multiple bullseyes and it's a mistake for us to assume that there's just one right answer and our job is to find it. KSS tell us that the most significant contribution to noise is what they call pattern noise. The variability among judgments giving rise to a pattern within and across judgments. The pattern of variability among judgments may mark the various bullseyes, each of which provides a solution to the problem. To think that messy cases are neat is to suppose that there's a single correct sentence to pass down for this particular defendant, a single correct way to deal with a problematic child who's been in and out of foster care, a single correct candidate to hire among a bevy of qualified candidates, and a single correct mark for the student essay. Of course, in many situations, a judgment or choice is forced. You know, you and I have to turn in some mark for each student that we grade. And if you're a judge who says, you know, the case admits of multiple legitimate answers, so I'll flip a coin, you'll be sanctioned as a judge in Kansas once was. These yes, no cases are the most extreme form of this forcing of judgment. Yes to bail, no to parole, yes to foster care, no to hiring this candidate. Many of the cases KSS discuss are framed in terms of this yes, no uh, mechanism, but this obscures the underlying normative reality of the case that it's messy and there are multiple legitimate ways to resolve it. The extra territorial demand for a yes, no answer simply obscures this underlying reality and leads KSS to conclude that this underlying variation of judgment is erroneous. But just because you have to say yes or no to a job candidate does not mean that there's no underlying reality in which this job candidate could have been either a yes or a no legitimately. Right? Sometimes we're forced to say yes or no, but in many of those cases, uh, you know, when we say yes, we could have just said no and both would have been legitimate. If we use an algorithm, 
what we end up doing is fixating on one legitimate bullseye among many legitimate bullseyes and impose it on everyone when the underlying normative truth is much more complex. So that it would be unfair. The deep point here is what about the relation between humanity and technology? So one chunk of human life is non-normative, trying to get from A to B, getting enough nutrients to survive, checking people off on your holiday shopping list and so on. But the bulk of human life is normative, deciding whether it's better to be in place A rather than place B, fashioning a good life, getting the appropriate presence for the people you love. The place in human life for normative judgments is messy and any algorithm that assumes that such judgments are neat profoundly misunderstands the human condition. Now, this leads us to the fairness question. If judgments in life are messy, if there are multiple bullseyes in much of human life, then a student cannot legitimately complain when she receives a 65 rather than a 69 or even a 70. Why is that? Well, because each of these marks are, we're assuming, legitimate assessments of her essay. It could then be a matter of moral luck. And here's where there's some overlap with Rachel's commentary. It could be a matter of moral luck, whether she gets a 69 Actually, it's not overlap, it's sort of coming at more or less just the opposite direction, right? Um, uh, it, it could be a matter of look who she gets right, as her marker. And so, uh, you know, just like it could be a matter of luck whether this defendant gets 18 months or two years, but by hypothesis, the, six, the 65 and the 70, the 18 months or the two years, they're both legitimate outcomes. So living a human life is critically and ineluctably a matter of being subject to normative luck in a kind of lottery among legitimate outcomes. So we could you know, adjust the premise of noise and say, well, noise is the undesirable variation in human judgments beyond the legitimate variation in human judgments. Could we do that? Well, there are two problems with this suggestion. First, the authors of noise seem to have a different premise in mind, one according to which, you know, if you have two circumstances that are identical, this is the, the kind of clean case, two circumstances identical in every relevant respect, and yet there are two different outcomes, that's noise. It's bad because one of those outcomes is erroneous and it's therefore unfair. They seem to presuppose that all judgments are neat cases, but such neatness is rare in the real world. It's rare because in the real world, there's always a difference that can make a normative difference. And it's these differences that dot our normative world with multiple bullseyes. The second reason is that once we recognize that there are more often than not multiple bullseyes and the most interesting normative judgments we make you know, within organizations and without, it's very much an open question as to how much noise there actually is. Sure, sometimes judgments go astray, but mere variability is not something to get bothered by. In the end, there's no avoiding doing the hard substantive work of figuring out which judgments are substantive outliers, right? Which ones are, are erroneous, they're, they're not legitimate outcomes as opposed to being judgments that are infrequently made. It's unclear how algorithms could help us with that hard substantive work. So let me leave you with two pictures about judgment variability and the role of technology in removing it. In one, we assume that in normative and non-normative questions alike, that there's a single bullseye and that people often miss it, involving mistake and unfairness and lack of credibility for the organization. In comes technology to help remedy mistakes and the consequent unfairness and bolster the reputation of the organization. The world is essentially neat and that's why technology can be a useful tool for tidying it up some, some more. In the world as I understand it, there are very frequently multiple legitimate bullseyes and the variation in judgment reflects this. Sometimes judgment goes horribly astray and we need to correct for that. 
but it's unclear just how widespread a phenomenon that is and whether machines are the way to correct for that. Noise on this picture would be a fairly insignificant phenomenon popping up only at the margins of human life. And um, it would be concerned only with substantively determined outlier judgments. On this picture, the world is essentially messy. Noise is something at the margins and living a human life involves being subject to legitimate judgment variability. So um, I found this book very scintillating, thought provoking, and actually sort of sparkly, right? But I'm, I also found it dangerous. I think it's dangerous because it offers up a picture of the world that is flattened into one in which for any question posed by an organization that holds itself out as uh, providing correct answers, that there's always a tidy single bullseye that really is the question and that the question really does have to aim at. And it's our job to try to hit it. And so if you have that view, then because we're mere mortals, surely why not have machines help us? If the world's not like this, if the world is fundamentally messy, then the picture it paints of the questions that matter to us doesn't fit us. What it is to be human is to live amongst a sea of legitimate judgment variation. Only with this view in mind of the world as irredeemably messy could we be properly placed to develop technology securely so that it becomes our handmaiden rather than our master. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ruth. And now I'm going to turn to our third and final commentator, Anand Rao. So when you're ready, Anand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, again, wanted to uh, thank uh, KSS for, uh, I think, a wonderful book, uh, Shining the Light on Human Judgment. Uh, my comments are very much coming from, uh, I would say, uh, two areas. So very much, how do you apply some of these things into the corporate world, into enterprise decision making. And uh, my background is very much in AI. So how does the algorithmic decision making and the human decision making essentially interact? So all of my thoughts are on this sort of intersection. Um, so the first point, so I want to make three points here. So the first point is primarily around the human judgment. And I'm focusing much more around the human judgment in enterprises. So the book goes into a number of tools, I would say could be very useful from a corporate decision-making perspective. And one of the things that KSS talk about is the noise audit, right? So in addition to a few other things, but noise audit is one of the key things for analyzing the, the human judgment. Now, um, I think the human judgment there, are, again, we went through uh, a, a number of things here, I think with the, with the other two panelists here. And I think most of the corporate decisions are largely messy. Uh, mm -hmm. As I would say, Ruth, from, from your description, there are sort of very messy decisions made by multiple people under multiple circumstances uh, with multiple backgrounds on how they came, the context around which they are making those decisions. Now, we understand that making those decisions are difficult, but the, the challenge with doing or even starting to analyze human judgment in enterprises, I think, is the lack of data. So uh, the reason I want to go to the noise audit is, again, the noise audit suggests that let's go understand what others have done and do the audit for the noises and the biases. Now, unfortunately, a huge number of decisions that corporates make uh, are undocumented, right? So yes, I think the authors go through recruitment decisions, performance reviews, and so on. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sure we can do some of the noise audits there, but there are a whole host of decisions where that go unrecorded, 
right? So investment decisions, various strategic decisions, operational decisions, and also the, the messiness of the, of the real world. It's not single decisions, it's decisions for the strength strung together in some kind of a strategy is basically what happens uh, in the corporate world. So I find that while the noise audit is is a great thing where where you have like in the judicial system or in the insurance is a great example right so again claims in insurance or underwriting in insurance are places where there is a log of all of these decisions which you can potentially go and analyze even if it's missed you can go and analyze but my challenge in in adapting and and applying this book is there is no decision log and one of the things that we have been talking about in the AI world is that just as we have a transaction log, and again, if you take 20 years before, back, uh, most of the transactions were happening with, with people to people. It was not mediated through machines. So there was nothing that we could analyze. Now, of course, you can go, uh, go into large organizations and analyze literally millions and billions of transactions and tease out from that what is the more efficient flow of information, uh, efficient flow of goods, right? So all kinds of algorithms which are able to operate on those transaction logs. So one of the questions to the authors and of course sort of more broader question to the community is, especially the enterprise community is, how can we create these notions of decision logs, which can start at least answering or, or leading us to more analysis. So fully take my other panelists viewpoints. It's a very messy situation and how do we operate? And I think we are sort of somewhat constrained by very limited data on how we as people do it. And I think the authors very much allude to certain points there in terms of human dignity and the flexibility to allow new values to emerge are some of the things. And I think it goes even fun, more fundamental than that. I think as humans, we don't want to be challenged. I am unique, you are unique, right? So each one is unique and we know what we are doing, right? So there is almost this arrogance on the part of human that I don't want to subject my decisions for any scrutiny. Uh, except for in a few areas where it's probably required by law, by regulation, then we record it. Otherwise, we, we want to stay behind this veil of uh, it is something that we just do and we are just good at, right? So that's the sort of the human judgment part. And the reason why I think understanding that is critical comes to my second point around algorithms, right? So now this is where uh, I would say that if we don't understand human judgment and the variations in human judgment, the noise and the bias in human judgments, whether it is messy or non-messy or neat situations or normative, non-normative situations, as you were saying, if we don't understand that, we have no hope to get our algorithms to behave in the right way, right? So again, the question is, what is the right way? And we as humans are the ones defining what that rightness is. So that's where I come to the second point around your mechanical decision-making, algorithmic decision-making. And uh, I know you devote a couple of chapters to that, chapter nine and 10, where you go into how the mechanical or algorithmic decision-making is based on simple rules and can provide, uh, and is better than human judgment. Um, and of course, uh, and I think you also mentioned there that there is an opportunity here to look at rich data and finding patterns, interesting patterns in that rich data. So on both of those, I, I would say, that's a somewhat of a simplistic view in terms of what is happening in the algorithmic decision making or AI. Uh, on, on, the, on the data part, again, it has been shown very well that just because you feed in a lot of data doesn't mean that the correlations are necessarily important correlation. It may be very spurious correlations. And there are a number of examples of that. So, and again, I think we need to be a bit more cautious around taking in all of the data and then finding these spurious correlations. So that's more on the data side. But on the algorithmic side, yes, if you just compare one algorithm built by someone and just apply it to judicial decision making and look at all the variations of all these judges and this algorithm, and I think uh, 
Ruth mentioned this, so you have identified one bullseye and implemented an algorithm and then saying that algorithm is much better than all the human variation. I think that's a very simplistic notion. We know that these algorithms themselves are being built by humans. As a result, we have the same baggage that we have in human decision-making. We are translating it into building those algorithms. So leave alone the decision-making yet in building the algorithms. These algorithms can be very different, again, based on a number of criteria Area, which everyone has sort of talked about, right? So based on the historical data, uh, uh, how many years of historical data goes into your algorithm, right? So three years, two years, five years, 10 years, you could get very different results based on the different techniques, regression versus deep learning. So some are explainable, some are not explainable. And more importantly, who builds the models, right? So is there enough diversity in who is building the model? So I see that there is a huge variation of all the algorithms that can be built for the same decision. So just as you have documented uh, level noise, pattern noise, occasion noise, in the case of human judgment, I think there is the same and even maybe more in the algorithmic decision-making. So there is a huge number of variations, noise and bias with an algorithmic decision-making. So you really can't compare just one algorithm with the humans and say, hey, this is doing much better than all of this in terms of reducing the noise, right? So we really need to be looking at the whole spectrum of algorithmic decisions, uh, how we build algorithms and how, how, how those algorithms, different algorithms would make different decision-making. That's where I think some of the, the challenges around consistency come in, Rachel, right? So if you don't require consistency for humans, that's fine. But as soon as we say the algorithms are not consistent, uh, everyone will jump on you and say, what do you mean it's not consistent, right? So that's not acceptable. An algorithm, again, we set higher standards as you talk about in your book, and that becomes very problematic. So if it's allowed for humans, but consistency, uh, if it's not allowed for humans, do we even require consistency in algorithms? If we don't, then we need to be able to uh, convey that to the, the people who are using it in a way that makes sense, which doesn't quite exist yet. So. I looked at the human decision-making and the algorithmic decision-making, but really I think what needs to happen is to bring the two together, right? So I know there's a lot of work happening within the, uh, within the AI and the, and, the, and the AI ethics domain in terms of socio-technical systems. To me, I think um, it's not so much the variation in the human decision-making or the variation in the algorithms, but can we reduce some of those variations using the algorithms? Can we bring the algorithms and the human decision-making together so that together we have better decision-making? So to me, it is less about replacing a human judgment with an algorithm. To me, it's more, how can you use algorithms to better inform human decision-making? Uh, so given the substantial variation in humans, uh, substantial variation in algorithms, we should really be consider considering this as a combined system of humans plus algorithms. Can we uh, get everything we want in that combined system as opposed to treating them as two different entities? So let's understand humans, let us understand uh, algorithms and put the two together. I think it becomes more complex. So in that notion, I think, um, if we go back into AI and algorithmic decision-making, one of the fundamental things that uh, AI prides itself or the reason why people adopt AI is that we make better decisions than humans, right? So any algorithms, the comparison of that is with respect to human decision-making. Now, what I very much like about this book is uh, just the variety of the human decisions. So better than which human? Uh, when that human made that decision, right? So is it a class of humans or is it just one human? Is it their best day or their worst day, right? So even just that, just that simple question has so many different possibilities that we really should be looking at it as to how do we solve that combined system, the total system of human machine collaboration. And I think that's almost critical for the way at least enterprises think about ROI for algorithms and everyone goes around saying return on investment uh, of AI, 
And very few are very clear on what is that return, what is that in investment, and to what extent the algorithm is better than human performance when there are challenges on both sides as to what is algorithmic performance, what is human performance. So my, my last point is basically, how do we bring the two together? Uh, so first is the limited applicability uh, on the on the enterprise level, given that there is a lack of decision data or decision log. The second one is the variations and noise in the, in the algorithms. And the third one is, should we not be really looking at this as a combined system so that we optimize both the algorithms and human decision-making together, uh, make these algorithms look for those multiple bullseyes in a messy world, but not really make those decisions and let the humans make those decisions and ease their decision-making, ease their noise by using these algorithms as opposed to these algorithms replacing them. So again, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to share my thoughts here. Thank you so much, Anand, and thanks to the three commentators for a really uh, rich set of comments. I'm gonna encourage the authors to switch on their cameras. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna take the risk of summarizing some of the main themes that have come up. Um, so the, just beginning um, with Rachel, she was making in effect the negative point that there is no consistency requirement as a matter of justice. You can't found that either in intuition or in a consideration based on the elimination of luck in decisions regarding things. Like Use the right two lanes to keep right to I-95 North Cap. Sass, could you, uh, Cass, could you um, mute yourself, please? I think we're hearing your GPS. Thank you. So Rachel's making that negative point. There is no requirement of consistency as a matter of justice. Ruth was making a more positive point, which is that the authors grossly under, overestimate um, how much noise there is in the sense of unwanted variability. Her claim is a lot of this variability is actually quite desirable because it simply reflects the messy decision-making situation of ordinary life where there isn't a single bullseye that we're aiming for, but multiple legitimate bullseye and people hitting different bullseyes that are within the bounds of the legitimate shouldn't be seen as fundamentally a problem. In fact, it's in some ways a benefit. And then thirdly, Anand raised a series of questions. One was how do we have these noise audits that the authors recommend in the absence of a uh, corporate decision log that logs all these decisions? Second, he suggested that there was a kind of simplistic view in the book about algorithmic decision-making methods powered by AI. Um, failure to take into account, for example, that such techniques could be undermined by defective data. But I think the more interesting point that was made was that, look, these algorithms are built by humans and therefore will exhibit variability themselves because they themselves will be the product of human decision in their design. And finally, Anand suggested that the real task here was to use algorithms to enhance human decision-making and find a way to have a kind of powerful combination of the two methods rather than to replace human decision-making wholesale. So I see I'm getting the thumbs up there from Rachel, so I must have done a good job. I'm now going to um, invite the authors to respond to any of those comments in the recognition of the fact that we've got limited time and you may want to prioritize some over others. So who wants to begin? Uh, I'm happy to, am, am I audible? I'm in a car and uh, they have safe driving mode, which is a form of, I'm not sure, algorithmic decision-making, which is misfiring. <laughs> but if I'm audible, I'd be delighted to give it a first you are, try. You are definitely audible, Cass, so please go ahead. Okay, so I'm very grateful for the various comments and I'll say a little bit about Rachel and Ruth's comments. Um, so on Rachel's point, we're working with an Aristotelian conception of equality, which is time-honored and uh, bedrock. So there could be a, an essay written about the idea that similarly situated treat, people should be treated similarly. And uh, unless you complicate the scenario such that they're similarly, they're not similarly situated, a justification of inconsistency would be, I think, unfathomably difficult to offer. Um, my preferred foundation for the Aristotelian conception of equality is Rawlsian, 
that behind a veil of ignorance, the idea that people should be treated differently just because of a lottery, depending on who, who turns out to the, be the decision maker, behind a veil of ignorance, we wouldn't want that. If skin color is morally irrelevant or gender, or the more contentious things that Rawls points to, this is a fortiori. So we didn't try to mount a defense of the idea that the similarly situated should be treated similarly. It would be interesting to write that defense. I think it would be baffling to conclude that that consistency requirement was not justified. And I don't believe the data. Uh, uh, the, uh, if there's a test devised in which the scenarios are described as genuinely similar, the idea that there's not a violation of justice when people are treated differently, I'd be very surprised not to find uh, that, that, that the Aristotelian conception of justice is widely held. On, on Ruth's point, uh, uh, which is would take a, a lot of words to come to terms with, um, think if you would, maybe of a concrete circumstance where there's either a predictive judgment being made where I guess she's with us, or whether there's a, a normative judge, normative-ish judgment being made. I want to be careful about the criteria about whether people get asylum in the United Kingdom or the United States. And let's suppose it turns out that whether you get asylum, this is not a predictive judgment, let's stipulate, depends on seven things or 12 things. So it's, it's messy in her sense, but that if the asylum officer, the immigration judge is sad because the football team that the asylum judge loves lost the day before, the person doesn't get asylum. And if the asylum judge or immigration officer is happy, because the sports team won, the person does get an asylum. Or let's suppose that the asylum officer is tired in the first case and energetic in the second case. Or let's suppose in the first case, the asylum officer is just a very severe person. And in the second case, the asylum officer is a very lenient person. Or it may be a product of pattern noise. So in any of those cases, even if there's a normative element or even if there's a um, messy situation, I guess in her sense that there are multiple criteria that it's hard to turn into a simple metric, the notion that there isn't a problem there, uh, I don't think on reflection Ruth believes. And I think what she's gesturing toward is the idea that there's something maybe in the situation that one of the judges is alert to that uh, a simpler framework wouldn't be alert to. Uh, we agree with that entirely, that that wouldn't be noise. I'm grateful to her for pressing the question of what is unwanted variability. That's an extremely good question. Uh, I don't agree with her that the notion that unwanted variability in our sense is the kind of uh, rare exception um, in contexts that range from medicine to asylum, to interviewing, to hiring, to criminal justice, to um, social security disability determinations and, you know, word social security made in multiple countries, but there's a program that has the space that social security does in multiple countries and their determinations are frequently noisy. Fingerprinting, if it's the case that it turns out even in what she describes as a messy situation that genuinely different, similarly situated people are treated different, differently, it isn't dangerous to call attention to A, the fact that that's scandalously unfair and be the fact that that imposes high costs. And if you don't like the word costs, think instead of death and illness and multiply them to a to, to big number and to try to reduce the, the death and illness isn't dangerous. That's what I have to say in my car where we are driving safely. Thank, Thank you. you. So much, Jess. I'm gonna go around to the other commentators first, but I just actually want to ask a question um, and I will come back to the panelists, to the other panelists to respond to the comments that have been made. Um, I think it is fascinating this when is variability unwanted. So I just wanna put forward a hypothetical case to see how, how far you're willing to press the Aristotelian intuition that treating like cases alike is always of great value. Um, imagine if an authoritarian state that enacts a law that says people of a certain religion 
or political persuasion or race have to go to the death camp. Okay, so that's the law. And they're very efficient bureaucracy that enacts this law very effectively with no noise. People who fall into the category of that, those groups are sent to the death camps. Then there's a resistance movement that arises and the resistance movement tries to address the issue partly by infiltrating the officialdom and they become officials in the system and then they don't apply the laws. They, they try to do exemptions uh, that are not legitimate according to the rules, but they exercise their power in order to save people from the death camps. Okay, so in this new situation, there's variability in judgment where there was no variability before. Now in the first situation where there's no variability, we can agree that there's an injustice. People are being sent to death camps who shouldn't go to death camps. In world B, however, where suddenly there is this variability, question arises, has a new injustice come into this world? Has the injustice come into the world of variability between judgments? So is the person now sent to the death camp subject to two forms of injustice? One injustice is he's sent to the death camp when he shouldn't be sent to the death camp in violation of his right to life. But secondly, he's subject to a second injustice, which is he's being sent to the death camp, whereas others exactly situated like him are not being sent to the death camp. Are we gonna say that there is an injustice there? Because that's, you know, if you say uh, reducing noise is always an improvement, then introducing noise presumably is always gonna be a bad thing. Is it a bad thing here? Danny, do you want to respond to this one or Cass, do you want to? Do we still have Cass? <coughs> well, well, any of you can uh, I, I would say this is pretty clearly a case in which noise is desirable if the basic, if you're talking about decisions that are uniformly bad or unjust and you change a few of them to make them better or more just, I don't think that anyone would argue that the, the badness of noise is such that we are going to prefer unjust decisions to be made consistently. Uh, the the consistency the is, principle doesn't go that far. No, I agree. So the point is not, we will all agree on the all things considered judgment that the situation where fewer people are going to the death camp is better. The question is though, is there still a badness that's been introduced, a pro tanto wrong, which is the variability itself is bad, but it's outweighed. By, my intuition would be there is no pro tanto wrong there that has to be outweighed. There's nothing bad about introducing this variability. Or do we say, yes, there is a badness introduced, but it's massively outweighed by the benefit of saving people. I mean, I think it's, I think it's really important here uh, to speak of what, what values are we maximizing? We, would, we were talking about an organization that exists and that has its objectives and how important it is for the organization to speak in one voice, basically, this is, this is the question. When it has multiple employees, uh, multiple members who make decisions on its behalf, would, a, would the organization be content to uh, speak in multiple voices or not? And, and, and here there is an interesting uh, there is an interesting distinction. We contend that yes, it is desirable in principle for the, an organization would want to speak in one voice. It may sometimes, there are situations in which it is not going to be possible for the organization to speak in one voice. And I think Ruth mentioned some one of them. I don't think really that in Oxford, I think this differences among markers in Oxford are clearly legitimate to some extent, but if, you found a great deal of variability. If there was a great deal of luck involved in the grading, I think, I think you might want to recognize that there is a problem, that you do not want the degree of, that somebody comes, out of, uh, comes with out of Oxford. You would not want that degree to be determined by any process that can be viewed 
as a process of block. So clearly the world is messy and clearly uh, there are going to be costs to imposing uniformity, but it is also the case that even in the situation that you described, I think you would want to set a limit and say, not anything goes. And I think you were going somewhat in the direction of, of anything goes. That is that wherever the, the people differ in their values, those differences are legitimate and hence uh, there is no requirement for the organization to speak consistently. I thought that view uh, was rather extreme and I thought you probably do not really hold it. If, if I might, might add something, the very fact that you can have this realization, Ruth, because you do have a requirement that two markers look at the same essay and grade it separately, is actually one of the noise reduction techniques that we would advocate because you first do, in fact, a noise audit. You have two different people look at the same case and realize that they disagree. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't know the magnitude of the problem. If it turns out that the problem is the difference between a 65 and a 69, so be it. And as Danny said, it's no big deal. If it turns out that is the difference, as in one of the examples you cited between failing and a first, and if that were a general rule, not a rare exception, I think we would all start to be concerned that the credibility of the degrees that Oxford uh, awards is in question. And more generally, we, I don't think we would say that there is a general requirement that luck play no role in anything in life. And this is more to Rachel's point. I think our concern here is that the role that luck plays or that chance plays is much greater than people assume it to be. And in fact, so large in many situations that it renders the processes on which we rely utterly unreliable and much more unreliable than we think they are. I think what I might do now is just ask maybe our commentators to respond to some of those um, responses. So maybe Rachel, do you wanna go first on this point about luck and then we'll move to Ruth. Sure, I guess I want to say a few different things. So the first thing I want to say is that whilst it's helpful to have the kinds of, um, well, it's helpful to have the argument sort of contextualized as lying within an Aristotelian tradition. I do think it's just worth flagging that this is a sort of slightly surprising affinity because at least on my understanding of Aristotle, a kind of Aristotelian tradition of thinking about judgments and human flourishing would be one which is much friendlier to the kind of picture of human life that was just sketched by Ruth in her wonderful comments than is sketched in the book. Um, the second more substantive thing I'd want to say is that I think it's really important to distinguish between two superficially similar claims. So one claim is that it's always a virtue to treat like cases alike. The other is that it's a requirement of justice to treat like cases alike. It's perfectly compatible with the consistency requirement being false, that it's always a virtue to treat like cases alike. I mean, here's an analogy. You might think, well, it's always good to have ice cream, right? Any situation can be improved with ice cream. I think that's probably true. Any situation can be improved by ice cream. That's fine. It's not a requirement of justice that every situation be accompanied with ice cream. So it's really important to see that the consistency requirement is perfectly compatible with thinking that Ketra's carabas, it is a virtue and a virtue of justice to treat like cases alike. What we would need for the consistency requirement to go through is the much stronger claim that, uh, that it is a, always a requirement of justice that like cases be treated alike, but that's tantamount to the consistency requirement. So I think that appealing to that to justify the consistency requirement is, is fairly close to question begging. Um, the third thing I'd like to say is that even if we take seriously this claim that like cases ought to be treated alike, there remains a further question, which is like with respect to what? Presumably we don't think, for example, there is any violation of justice whatsoever if one judge wears wool and another judge wears satin, right? Nobody would think, oh, well, these cases haven't been treated alike because one, justice, ju what, ju one judge is wearing wool and another judge is wearing satin. So it's a normatively significant question, right? When we say like cases must be treated alike, we're always tacitly packing in 
the following expansion, right? Like cases must be treated alike with respect to normatively significant features. But which features are normatively significant? That itself is a significant normative question. So I don't think that you can appeal to this slogan, like cases must be treated alike, and ask it to do any substantive argumentative work for you before you have spelled out like with respect to what. Um, the final thing I want to say is just to make a little point about this appeal to reliability, because I think that particularly, it's just really important to see that particularly, I mean, I'm not really interested in the cases where it's like clearly an empirical question. I'm much more interested in, in the normative cases like Bruce. The whole idea of reliability, to even talk about reliability in these cases, is to presuppose a substantive metanormative view, right? I'm tempted by a view of justice on which, you know, so Ruth sketched this picture of the world in which there are multiple legitimate bullseyes. I'm tempted by a view which says, look, in judgments about what justice requires, there are no legitimate bullseyes, right? For something to be a legitimate bullseye just is for the dart to hit the board in a place where the person who has thrown the dart is subject to various procedural requirements, like that they've considered the case carefully enough, right? So one picture of the world you can have is there's always a single bullseye. That's a sort of monism about truth. Another view of the world you can have is there are multiple different bullseyes. That's the kind of picture Ruth sketched. That's a kind of pluralism about truth. But I think there is, you know, a deep and important tradition in meta-ethical theorizing on which we reject both of these pictures. And we say, no, there is no bullseye like before the dart is thrown. What it is for a dart to hit the bullseye is for the dart to be thrown in the right manner, in the, for the dart to have been thrown in the right spirit. And if that's the kind of metanormative view that you're tempted by, then this whole appeal to reliability just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't get any traction whatsoever. So, I mean, maybe my meta-ethical, my metanormative position is incorrect and Olivier's is right. Like, that's totally possible. But it's worth noticing that there is this really substantive metanormative presupposition in any conversation about justice where we talk about reliability. Great, thank you so much. And now Ruth, do you want to respond to what's been said? Sure, thanks, John. Um, thanks for those uh, replies. I, in case there's any doubt, I love this book. I, I really loved it, okay. Um, but I'm, I'm still a little disturbed. So I think what you guys call noise is in my view, just the range of legitimate variation in judgment, especially in the normative realm. Okay, now in reply, it sounds like everyone's on the same page, that of course there's a range of legitimate judgments. So the bullseye is kind of fuzzy, right? There's a, there's a lot of different correct ways to carry on. Uh, and once you allow that, then the question becomes, is noise than the illegitimate variability. It's all the variability outside the bullseye now expanded. And in order to determine the extent of that and the badness of that, we have to do substantive theorizing. We have to look and see whether there's a lot of, you know, kind of crazy variation where we think, oh, that's not good, right? If, if every student essay at Oxford is either a first or a fail, we've got a problem. I think we all agree with that. But whether or not we have a problem when an asylum judge or a sentencing judge or a bail bond hearing judge makes one determination as opposed to another, given seven or 12 factors that may as a substantive matter allow for multiple bullseyes, right? Multiple results is a substantive matter. One has to look and see. And I, I guess I think it's probably just, it's not enough to point to the facts, the statistics of variability without also having a substantive normative argument that um, this kind of variability is not within the range of legitimate outcomes. Now I realize that on the face of it, and Cass pressed exactly on the right point, is you know if you think intuitively, uh, uh, certain many of these organizational decisions have huge impacts 
on a person's life. So if it's legitimate to weigh the factors for granting asylum this way, where the answer is yes, asylum, but it's also legitimate to weigh the seven to 12 factors this way, so the so um, you don't grant asylum, that seems kind of strange, right? Don't we want a world in which uh, when you have this kind of complexity, nonetheless, we can always get to, um, you know, yes or no, but not yes and no. Uh, and I think that that's the point I'm trying to make when I somewhat provocatively said that I thought the book was dangerous, right? The book is dangerous because it, it, it feeds into this picture of, you know, how the world works. Um, that, you know, that complex normative life really is a matter of just weighing all the complex factors in a, a most wise and enlightened way as is humanly possible. And then, or, you know, take Rachel's case, following certain procedures, deliberating, and then coming to a conclusion. That's, that's not the right picture of normativity, right? Normativity allows for a wide range of legitimate outcomes. And some of those outcomes will be pretty severe, you know, and their consequences for the well being of certain people. And we should be concerned about that. But if normativity really is like this, then I think it's a mistake to try to pretend it's something else. Um, and I guess I have a general worry that a lot of the AI literature, it seems to me, pretends that normative questions are flat and they're like predictive questions. Uh, and that to me is dangerous. Um, I think you're calling the book dangerous is going to do wonders for sales, actually. <laughs> Indeed, it does need further sales. But um, can I, I will ask the, the authors to respond to this point, but I just, can I just clarify one thing? So Ruth is presenting the picture of messy situations where there isn't a single correct answer, but there is a bounded group of equally eligible answers. Is it the position of the authors that there can be noise within the bounded group? Or uh, there, uh, I think there is a disagreement, uh, which is an empirical disagreement, about the frequency of neat and messy cases. Right. And certainly about the frequency of neat and messy cases in the situations that, that we discussed. Our model was the basic model of judgment that we proposed is a, is a measurement model. So where there is a single bullseye and a single value, and in many organizations for many decisions, uh, there is a single bullseye, even if it is difficult to define. That is, it is fairly clear for say an insurance company that <clears throat> it would be, if, if there is a, a correct answer, and in principle, there must be a correct price such that uh, going over it or going under it is going to be costly to the organization. There's going to be a maximum, however you wish to define the, what the premium, how the premium should be. For the physicians, I think there is no question. In hiring, I would say no organization would want, uh, an organization has fairly clear values about what it wants to maximize and hiring uh, is not a matter where anything goes. It is a matter of executing the organization's value. I think that evaluating personnel, uh, the idea that uh, people who are being evaluated, that it's completely legitimate to evaluate their performance in very different ways in their job, not, not as upset students uh, who are being marked one way or another, but where their livelihood depends on it, I think this strikes me as unacceptable. Now, it is clearly the case that there are going to be differences and so long as people are going to be making those decisions, uh, uh, there is going to be variability. 
I would expect an organization to try to reduce that variability. I would expect if there are substantial uh, deviations among Oxford professors as to the weighting of different attributes, I would hope for a commission of professors to try to bring to improve the consensus of that issue. If, if judges differ widely on criteria for asylum, I think they would recognize that this is not a desirable situation and they would want to try to the extent possible to minimize their differences. So I, I would say, first of all, there are more neat cases, I think, than, um, you know, there are sufficient, let me put it this way, there's a sufficient number of neat cases to write a book about them. That is, and to say that noise in neat cases is undesirable. But we were making an additional point, which is that in messy cases, an effort should be made to try to make them as neat as possible. And that is in the interest of fairness. It's not uh, in the interest of fairness, in the interest of legitimacy of the organization. Um, and, and I will rest there. Do any of the other authors want to respond to what's been said? Sorry, Olivia, you're, you're muted. Sorry, perhaps just to, to expand on, on the, the Aristotelian, Rawlsian point. Rachel proposed a, a thought experiment about chance uh, with the Vermont and New Hampshire border. Here's another one, and I'd be really interested, and this is an empirical question, I'd be really interested in knowing what people's intuitions are about that if we sample people. Suppose that you tell people you've been, you know, justice has been served by having a procedure, your procedural requirements have been satisfied, and a hundred different judges have looked at this case, and we've taken the average of all their judgments, and your sentence is X. So we've done on, on a larger scale what the two graders of Ruth's uh, uh, grading situation are doing. We've discussed our judgments, and we've average them and we've come to a determination of what must be the most just and most accurate sentence. But now we have a chance device, we have a roulette and we're going to spin it and it's going to add a very large random number which could be plus or minus with an average of zero to your sentence. Would that not be a problem? And who, who would sign, who, who would sign up to, be, to, to take part in that experiment? I'd be very tempted to know if people you know, still do not have a consistency requirement when we describe it this way, and if they think that this sort of variability is acceptable. And when you look at the asylum judges, for instance, it is sure normatively difficult to define who should be admitted and who should not be admitted in the US, and there are many considerations, but if you look at the fact that one judge admits 5% of applicants and the other admits 88%, I find it difficult to believe that the procedural requirement that they're throwing the same darts towards the same target has been fulfilled. This, strongly, this magnitude strongly suggests that it's not just the outcome of the same procedure being applied, but in fact, a very different procedure being applied by these two judges. So just wanted to expand on these two examples. Okay, um, that's very helpful. Yeah, so one, one, yeah. I, can I just now just sort of draw our attention to the comments that Anna made earlier about the difficulty of implementing some of your proposals like the noise audit, how do you do that without documenting all the relevant corporate decisions? Also the idea that algorithmic decision making may reproduce the variability of human judgment because algorithms themselves are constructed by humans and can be constructed in different ways and isn't really the thing we should be looking for, a, a happy integration of human and autonomous, uh, um, automated decision-making rather than the replacement of human beings. Well, um, the noise audit, as we proposed it, is really a, a special exercise with new problems or fictitious problems that are presented to a large number of people. So you do not need to document previous cases in order to run a noise audit. The, so the noise audit in the insurance company was uh, run by creating a set of problems by having the underwriters or the, the leaders of the underwriting group create a set of problems. 
and present those problems to various of the writers. So the noise audit does not depend on existing information. With respect to algorithms, then obviously, well, algorithms do not reproduce the noise of people, but uh, algorithms can certainly reproduce the bias uh, of people. And so there are better and worse algorithms. And uh, we hope that people construct algorithms that are un as unbiased as possible. I mean, clearly, uh, we are not unconditionally favoring algorithms over people. Uh, this is really not the point. Uh, you raised a very interesting point, and I, I'm going to make a contentious assertion. Uh, you raised the, the point about the value of combining algorithmic and human judgment. And here there is an interesting history. And the history, the, the best example probably is chess, where uh, after Garry Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue, he argued for a number of years that the best combination would be a human and a grandmaster. But in today's world, where you have AlphaGo and AlphaZero easily beating the world champion, uh, algorithms, once they come close, to human performance will inevitably, quite quickly, overtake humans simply because they learn more. But algorithms are fed by all the information from every user of the algorithm, and very quickly, their database of information is going to be greater than that of humans. So I think that, that the idea of collaboration between human and algorithms is attractive, but I think we should be wary of it because when such a collaboration is possible, I do not think that it will be stable. In many cases, it will not be stable. And, and we could anticipate that the algorithm will perform better than humans if today they are performing almost as well. Yeah, and then so, can, yeah. so just one comment on that, right? So yeah, I fully agree at some point, the algorithms might perform better. Uh, as we have seen in some of those, but I think the complexity of the real world decision making and all the normative things that we just discussed sort of far outweighs anything like even the game of Go or chess or any of that, where again, there are very clear uh, outcomes, number of players, right? So all of them are much more tractable, uh, not to say that AI will not get there to be able to do that. And I think for even AI to get there to be able to do that, I think the analysis of human judgment, I think is critical um, so that we can even get there, right? So, but I, I think it's still a long way that uh, for a general purpose, algorithm to do be performing better than all of us, even just this conversation, even if you have a very intelligent, um, GPT-3 listening to all of these things and then commenting, it would come nowhere near any of the discussions that we have had, I think. So that's why a little bit of skepticism that it may not happen in my lifetime. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Are there any comments the other authors wish to pick up on? So let me ask the authors. I, I might say that I, I'm enjoying this immensely and uh, the pressing on the similarly situated people being treated similarly, the consistency requirement by Rachel, I'm extremely grateful for. And uh, I think for all of us, maybe Rachel in particular to think about this and write about this would be very worthwhile. I also think there's an empirical project that Rachel signals about what people think about the equality idea. And I'm confident that the intuitions will line up with the moral commitment in the book, but confidence sometimes turns out to be erroneous. Uh, on uh, Ruth's uh, concerns, I, I, I'm thinking that there, are, once we disaggregate among domains, the dis disagreement might become very, very narrow. So it can't be the case, I think, that in norm contexts that are normatively laden, that we're content with noise, that even if asylum determinations or criminal punishment have A, multiple factors involved and B, an evaluative component rather than simply a predictive component, if, if 
uh, take the case of differences depending on people's mood, how happy they are, how tired they are. That would not be anything to celebrate. And if we have different patterns across decision makers, that wouldn't be either. And I'm wondering whether Ruth's cases, once we particularize them, will think they might, the cases she's thinking about might be cases in which someone's alert to something in particular, and, and that's to be celebrated, or in which we're learning from divergence of views, and that can be productive at the system level, even if it, at a static moment in time, it produces unfairness and costs. Thank you so much, Cass. I know that Rachel wants to respond to something that Olivier said. So Rachel, would you like to respond? Hi, yeah, I love the case you came up with uh, of the, the sort of having all the judges sort of consider the case in a procedurally legitimate way and then sort of spinning a roulette wheel. Um, so what I would say is, I'm not actually totally sure what I think about this kind of case, but I guess what I'm inclined to say is something like, I'm totally on board with the idea that there are certain kinds of luck that are incompatible with justice. Like, I mean, I, I totally agree that the sort of straightforward lottery case is horrible and a complete violation of justice. I just think not all cases of luck, not all kinds of luck are incompatible with justice. So I'm not under any pressure to say that this is a just case, right? Because I'd only be under that kind of pressure if I thought, no, there's never a tension between luck and justice. But I think it's just a subtler, more nuanced situation than that. I think there are some cases where luck and justice are in tension and others where they're not. For me, I mean, my main job is I'm an epistemologist. And so there's a really striking parallel here between uh, justice and knowledge, because one of the sort of major insights of epistemology in the last 20 years is that luck and knowledge interact in a very similar way. There seem to be certain kinds of lucky true beliefs that cannot be knowledge, right? Certain kinds of lucky true belief cannot be knowledge, but it seems like there are other kinds of environmental luck that don't disqualify a belief from being knowledge. And so I suspect my hunch is that there's going to be a really instructive structural similarity between the kinds of luck that are knowledge destroying and the kinds of luck that are justice destroying. The really interesting question, once we distinguish between these two kinds of luck, right, the justice destroying luck and the luck that we can be sanguine about from the perspective of justice, then the interesting question becomes, which species of luck is the kind of luck that you draw attention to in your book? And I mean, I think that's like a substantive and interesting question. I just don't think it's obvious on the face of it, which of these species of luck it belongs with. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say, uh, you made this point, you said, well, look, in many cases, shouldn't noise or putative noise suggest to us that sort of procedural requirements are not being, uh, are not being acted in accordance with? And I think that's completely right. I, I think that's a very tempting and plausible uh, line to take. So this would be a way in which a proceduralist someone with a kind of proceduralist metanormative view could tell a story about why at least certain kinds of noise are troubling. It's just that the kind of deep normative story underpinning what's troubling about those kinds of noise would be very different to the one that's sort of gestured towards in the book. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm gonna go now to Ruth and to Anand to say anything they want to say in wrapping up. So Ruth. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, so I'm trying to find out exactly where we agree and disagree. Um, so neat cases, yes. So I think that uh, Danny and uh, Cass both said, look, let's disaggregate and point to the neat cases and there's plenty to write about there. So I guess I'm still a little grumpy about that because um, the, the kinds of neat cases that are completely clean, let's take an insurance company. If the point is to maximize profit, then absolutely. Uh, there's a price, there's an evaluation that is the best one to maximize profit. But in the real world, any insurance company, that's not all they're about. When they make a decision about how to value some property, there are a bunch of factors, including evaluative factors. Uh, and so there's a normative judgment involved. And once there's a normative judgment involved, then there's this question, well, is, the, is my neighbor in the next cubicle when he goes $1,000 more than me, is he off kilter? Is that noise? Is one of us mistaken? Or is it just that there's a range of legitimate 
valuations, given all of these factors, besides just trying to maximize profit. Um, so when, um, you know, say me, John and I, we discuss the marks of a student, I think what we're not doing is a noise audit. This goes to Olivier's point, because what we're doing is we're actually learning, which I think all three authors would agree is something that's good. Um, because there is no noise where we have legitimate judgments. And this is how, I mean, I think this is such an important point. This is how we get to become better judges. Uh, and so I think the bottom line is a kind of, maybe, maybe it is empirical. Maybe Professor Kahneman is right, but it's, how much do the clean, neat cases actually figure in real world decisions without the messiness that I think accompanies them? And that's really the point of disagreement. Thank you. Anand. Yeah. So uh, again, a fascinating discussion here, right? So in terms of the, the decision making, um, Yes, I think I agree that there is a range of uh, variability in all of our decisions. And it is predominantly messy, at least in the corporate decisions, I would say. And to me, I think whether there are, in fact, adequate number of need cases within this messiness, or whether all of it is messy or almost everything is neat, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that, right? So, and then part of the quest of this book is, hey, are there some of these neat cases? The way I was looking at this book is, everything is messy, but can we just go and start looking at judgments that we make in the corporate world, look at decisions or judgments that we make, and then start categorizing these judgments or decisions into various buckets, long-term, short-term, sequenced, and so on. Um, and some of them may be straightforward, right? So I think some of the things that, that you mentioned, Rachel, sort of the, the non-normative ones that we can just say, yeah, here are some of those decisions. How do we go about doing it? Can we reduce noise there? Is it a neat case? Maybe it is. Um, but in the other ones is much more messy, even having a process of going deeper and then analyzing it, just using the tools that have been given, I think will start leading to some kind of a crystallization of some of these messiness into neater buckets that we can then start addressing, at least in my case, I'm sort of much more interested from an empirical perspective, right? So there is so much of messiness in this corporate decision-making, there has to be a better way, right? So yes, there are still a lot of unsolved problems, right? So there are normative questions, there are sort of value-driven uh, things that we do, but there are still a substantial number of decisions. I'll take another one, investment decisions. Almost every company makes investment decisions. So depending on the size of the company, they say, this year we are going to uh, into invest, what about 3%, 5%, 5 million, 10 million. The kind of decisions that goes on there, I would sort of argue it's sort of very loose. There is no structure to it. And again, there might be multiple bullseye. Fully agree that there might be multiple bullseye. So you might decide that, hey, why don't we invest in a number of small projects working with startups and let's see what the value is. Or some others might say, no, why don't we invest in a couple of them, get deeper and then hit the, hit the home run, right? So again, who knows which one is right or not, but there is not sufficient rigor in pursuing each one and then methodically even setting up two teams and going, yes, we'll give X amount for one type why I'm on for the other, and let's go and methodically uh, log and see the decisions, measure it, come back as an organization. And so that's what I see as sort of the, the turning the messiness into the neatness and having some tools to be able to do that. And that's where I find the sort of the practical value of the book is in using some of those tools, right? So again, as you talk about some of the cascading things, 
let's be conscious, right? So, and, and say, we know that that cascading is happening. So let's try and address independent decisions. Let's then see the value. Let's do the scoring. Let's see which scoring works for these, right? So over a period of time, I think that I think is the sort of the most valuable uh, aspects of some of the of the book in applying it to the corporate world. I'm I'm just hoping that more more organizations will start doing it that can then lend empirical data for the analysis and for the discussion that we are talking about here. Thank you so much, Anand. So I want to give the last word to Daniel Kahneman, and I also want to ask the question to him, are there any domains of decision-making which in principle AI should not be permitted to enter into that should be kept in the hands of humans in principle? Well, uh, my first comment was that I'm going to take off from something that Olivier said. In general, in all situations in which you would consider that averaging the judgment of multiple people is a good thing, those are the situations in which we talk about noise. That is, where you trust the averaging process, then uh, deviations from the average can be viewed as luck and can be viewed as noise and are undesirable. So this principle of averaging is essential to the definition of what we're talking about. And I think it would include some of the cases that Ruth described as messy. Uh, and the other point with respect to Ruth is um, where there is a possibility of learning, where, for example, noise leads to disagreement and to, to discussion, we are all in favor of discussion but the objective of the discussion is to reach some unanimity is, is ultimately to reduce noise. So learning and noise reduction go together. And we certainly uh, accept that there should be differences and that these differences should be reduced. With respect to the normative question of uh, whether there ought to be decisions that, that AI will not be allowed to uh, my, I do not have a good response. I do not have any, and, and the reason I think that I do not is this is, all our views of AI are going to evolve. Human views of AI are going to evolve within you know, the next few decades. The, the developments currently are so rapid and so much is going to happen and so much is already happening in the sense of developing AI that, that considers values and AI that interacts with humans, that the situation of think that we cannot predict uh, what AI will look like when the question of what we should bar from it becomes relevant. Okay, too early to say. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been a really rich and illuminating discussion. A lot of um, diverse and conflicting judgments have been expressed, but one thing, um, there's no noise about the fact that noise is a great book, a scintillating book that people should read and reflect on the really pressing and interesting questions that it raises. I just wanna thank again, very much the three co-authors for the honor that they've done us in being uh, willing to attend this event and to engage with the criticism from our commentators. And thank you to our three splendid commentators. Really, really appreciated your comments. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to those of us who have been viewing this event. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.